You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, wildfires in Siberia this summer have produced more greenhouse gases than Germany does in an entire year. The 1980s environmental agreement reducing the impact of climate change today. And Sweden's highest mountain shrinks because of a melting glacier. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show. As fires burned around the world this year at a record-breaking rate, skies turned to red and vast landscapes were blanketed with a thick smoke. Now, this picture by NASA shows the smoke across the Republic of Saka in Russia. And now data shows the carbon emissions created by these wildfires. And although Europe has suffered some of its worst fires in decades, it's parts of Russia where fire emissions are dramatically greater than the rest of the world. Well, we'll look at that data in just a moment. But first, let's remind ourselves of where those fires are. Well, firefighters are working to contain multiple fires that are burning in France, Spain and Portugal today. Now, these are the latest areas around the Mediterranean to be affected by fires. And in the past few weeks, we've seen fires across Greece, Algeria, Spain and Turkey. It's also the same for large parts of Western US, in particular, California, where the state's second largest wildfire has been raging since July. Well, heat waves and drought have fueled fires in Siberia too this summer. In July, we reported from the Gorny district where temperatures of 39 degrees intensified the conditions there. Meanwhile, this chart shows the level of carbon being emitted from wildfires around the world. And you can see the yellow line, which shows that from 2016, carbon generated by wildfires in the Saka Republic of Russia started to increase. And this year has reached more than 200 megatons, with other areas, Canada, the US and the Mediterranean, including Europe, much further behind. In fact, emissions from Siberia this year alone are equivalent of some 953 megatons of carbon dioxide. That's far greater than Germany's greenhouse gas emissions for an entire year, which itself has the highest emissions of any European country. Well, let's bring in then our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, now. So, Diana, give us an idea of the extent of the wildfires there this summer, Diana, and uh, what's the situation like now? So it's a record-breaking year, more than 2012, which was the biggest year on records for wildfires before. And it's an astonishing statistic. The Siberian wildfires, or fires across Russia, have burnt a larger area than all those other wildfire hotspots that you mentioned. So all of those combined are less than what's burnt in Siberia, which is why those emissions are so huge. And it's not just because of abnormally hot weather and very little precipitation. It's also uh, because of forestry mismanagement. And there is still quite a big practice of uh, burning for agricultural purposes in Russia, which can uh, catch fire uh, to forest uh, and, and, have, and, and, and start wildfires that way. Um, Russia also tends to only focus in terms of firefighting on those wildfires which are near human habitation because this is such a vast uh, area and Siberia is largely uninhabited, which means that huge wildfires are allowed to burn unchecked. They really can't get near them and they can't possibly fight them. And that also contributes to uh, this problem. And that is why you're seeing the, the fires at the scale that we're seeing them uh, and with the kind of emissions we're seeing them, because as they burn unchecked, of course, huge amounts of carbon are released into the atmosphere. The permafrost on which much of Siberia and this coniferous forest there is based uh, starts to melt, releasing carbon into the atmosphere too. And smoke from the fire starts to coat the snow further north, which has a, a very bad warming effect too. So it all contributes. Diana, thank you. Well, we'll be joined by the expert behind that wildfire emissions research next. But first, let me take you over to our data dashboard, which shows how many tonnes of CO2 has been emitted in the world since records began. You can see the figure down here and that number ticking up constantly, as you can see. 
Well, joining us now is Mark Parrington, a senior scientist at the ECMWF Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. That's a weather forecasting group in Europe. Uh, so welcome to you. Now, we do see wildfires every year, don't we, across the world. But are they any more widespread this year globally? And what does that mean for their carbon footprint? That's right. We're seeing fire, a lot of wildfires and, well, open burning also. That, that they're not always wildfires because they're, they're often set for agricultural purposes um, around the world every day. Um, in the summer months, we expect to see wildfires in the boreal forests in Siberia and, and in North America. But what does stand out this year, particularly in the Saka Republic, is just the real um, scale and the persistence at which they've been burning at high intensity. We've been monitoring these fires essentially since the middle of June, um, and only now in recent days does it look like there might be some abatement in their activity. And how do you explain why those fires in Russia are particularly bad? Um, so one common feature of these wildfires in, in Russia, but also in North America and those around the Mediterranean we've been seeing, is that they're occurring where there's been much drier conditions and when heat waves come along, this is increasing the flammability of the fuel. That's how ready it is to burn. So that when there's an ignition, the, the risk of a fire starting is much higher and the, the scale at which they can burn is, is, is clearly much higher as well. And it's not just the carbon emissions that are a cause for concern, is it? What about the particular matter that they give off as well? How worrying is that? Uh, this is very concerning. This is one of the, the, the clear, direct impacts of these fires on, uh, is on air quality. Um, wildfire smoke consists of particulate matter, but also a wide range of very hazardous and, and toxic gases, uh, which are very unpleasant and which um, would add you know, quite a lot of air pollution on top of um, already existing pollution sources in urban environments. Um, and indeed, in some of the cities downwind of these fires, Yakutsk, for example, in Siberia or Athens in, in Greece, have all had advisories for, for air quality and degraded air quality in, in recent weeks. Mark Parrington, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. In today's other climate news, environmental groups are calling on the fishing industry to do more to decarbonise the sector. A report led by WWF estimates that UK fisheries emit the same amount of CO2 as 110,000 homes over a year. It says that measures need to be introduced to protect carbon stored in seabeds and preserve marine life. The fishing industry says it's taking steps to address environmental concerns. The National Trust says more funding is needed to protect the Lake District's landscape from erosion. The Fix the Fells scheme says the area is rapidly being destroyed as a result of an increasing number of visitors to the area during the pandemic. Nearly £10 million has been spent to repair footpaths and protect wildlife since it was set up in 2001. And Sweden's last remaining mountaintop glacier is at its lowest height since records began. The southern peak of Kebnekaise mountain was measured at 2,094 metres above sea level by researchers from the Tafula Research Station. Scientists at Stockholm University said it's losing height due to rising air temperatures and changing wind conditions. And you can see more on that story on our website, which tracks how glaciers are shrinking. Just head over to skynews.com slash climate. Now, more than 30 years ago, the world's leaders came together to sign the Montreal Protocol, an environmental agreement banning production and use of CFCs that were damaging the ozone layer. More than 30 years later, a study in Nature has said that this treaty has not only started to heal the ozone layer, but has reduced the impact of climate change. Already, a number of countries have signed an international agreement, the Montreal Protocol. Where there is no CFC alternative, Good housekeeping and better priorities will keep emissions down.
The EU generated more electricity from solar power in June and July than ever before. New data from the think tank Ember estimates it accounted for 10% of the total energy produced in the region. New records were also set in eight EU countries, including Spain and Germany, as the production and use of solar panels increased. Well, let's take a look at how we're faring here. And this line at the top on our data dashboard shows us where electricity in Great Britain is coming from today. And you can see there, 37% is coming from fossil fuels. We've got 44% from renewables, which includes, of course, solar power. And we've got 19% coming from nuclear. And finally, six-year-old Alicia Gardia from Nottingham is riding 50 miles on her scooter to help save the Amazon rainforest, proving that we can all do our bit to tackle climate change. Hello, my name is Alicia and I am six years old. I am scooting 50 miles over my summer holidays to raise money for cooler. I have raised nearly £2,000 in just over two weeks. I am writing letters to important people to ask them what they are doing about climate change. Here's a letter from the Queen. Here's a letter from Boris Johnson. Here's a letter from Sir David Attenborough. Climate change is important to me because without the rainforest, all the animals will die. We only have one Earth, so we need to look after it. And so far, Alicia Gardia's scooting challenge has raised more than £3,000 on the Just Giving page so far. Well, that's everything from us for today. Thanks for watching. See you next time.